Welcome to the new Cody Farms Museum. The mural that you are looking at sits at the exit of the lobby of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West and at the entrance of the hallway that leads you to the new Firearms Museum. As you can see through the mural and the mission statement here, this is a quick glimpse of the different types of topics we will be addressing inside the museum. As you round the corner into the CFM breezeway or hallway, you will see a temporary photo exhibit that talks about the entire history of the Cody Firearms Museum collection, from its earliest roots with Oliver Winchester in the 1870s, to the first Winchester Museum in New Haven, Connecticut, to its relocation to Cody, Wyoming in the 1970s. As the mural continues to expand, it showcases the transition of the Winchester Museum into the Cody Firearms Museum that opened in this exact space in 1991. It was in this configuration until it reopened after a $12 million renovation in July of 2019. You will also see a frequently asked questions panel. These are the types of things that we are asked as museum professionals at the Cody Firearms Museum pretty much every day. Then you will notice our collections connections that showcase Abercrombie and Fitch, Louisville Slugger, and Ford Automotives, three mainstream histories that have a tie into the firearms world. And of course, a gun fan that harkens back to the original gun fan of the Cody Firearms Museum from 1991. The first gallery that you'll see in the museum is our primer or our Gun 101. This section interprets kind of a beginner's look at firearms history with a example of technology, definitions, how action types work, parts of the firearm, and even teaches you tips at the range so that you can start to understand how firearms operate and all of the jargon that a lot of people who understand firearms already know so that you're not overwhelmed when you go into the real meaty historical parts of the museum. These action types are hands-on interactives that people can start to learn what is a bolt action, what is a semi-automatic, what's a lever action, and also what's a brake action. Towards the rear of the gallery is our modern shooting sports wing, and this looks and teaches people about firearm safety as well as proper grip and stance if you were to go to the range. And once you take a look at all of these different interactive elements, you can combine what you learned about the safety, about the respect of the firearm, and also proper handling, and apply it to a free steel challenge simulator that is a semi-automatic handgun where you can try your hand at trying to shoot accurately and correctly. And if you can do it fast, even better. This front simulator that you can see is made by LaserShot, and there are several other simulators throughout the museums. This is just the first one that you can encounter. The next gallery is our Evolution of Firearms, and this is kind of a fast track museum. If you don't have a lot of time, you can start at the beginning, go all the way up through modern day, and get a true glimpse of the overall history of firearms internationally. As you can see, this starts with early firearms as well as crossbows and longbows, and talks about the development. Along the timeline here, you can see that there are pullouts of key words, key terms, and then key events in firearms and ammunition history. Off to the right and left of these cases, you can go more in depth on particular topics. Some of those topics include a look at the transition from individual artistry and gunsmithing guilds to interchangeable parts. Others that look at increasing firepower, whether it be from one round and one shot to multiple rounds or improvements in ammunition technology. The Old West. A look at the post-Civil War period and the transition from firearms as necessity to firearms of leisure and recreation, as well as the formulation of National Rifle Associations around the world. 
As you continue along, you learn about the 20th century and more modern technology. And then the final thing that you can learn about is the experimentations in synthetics that you see today. At the end of this timeline are additional comprehensive timelines and an ability for you to discuss what you learned in this space. Now, as you walk down one side of the case, you see kind of the traditional firearms history. The back sides are meant to show you some of the anomalies that exist. And one centerpiece to this gallery is a mural that was done in 2018 and featured in the Times Magazine. Now, this section of the timeline is a look at the pop culture of the West. So the guns that we associate with the Wild West, thanks to Buffalo Bill's Wild West, as well as Westerns. And it leads to the entry point of the Firearms in the West Gallery. As you walk down this hallway, you will start to encounter the different firearms that impacted the American West. Off to the right, you'll see a little bit of a play on a traditional gun fan, we call it the gun wave, featuring some of the guns that used to be at the front of the old Cody Firearms Museum. And off to the left, you'll look, you'll look at a chronology of different types of guns and how they were used in the West, including warfare, sport, law and order and crime. And this takes a look at some key significant pieces from the collection, including Liberating Johnson's Hawken, as well as Cassie Waters, the local madams, Hopkins and Allen revolver. Now here you've got kind of a choose your own adventure. You have the Gold Reef hardware store where you can encounter the different things that people could afford in the West because a Winchester was expensive for some people. So a lot of post-war weapon surplus guns were featured. Additionally, in this space, you can learn about early firearms advertising, who they were marketing to, what types of products they were marketing and how they were doing it. And finally, you can see a lot of the products that you would see in the hardware store, but these ones have a twist. Most of the ones that you can see here were made by Winchester in the post-World War I period. Next to that space, you've got a recreation of the Browning Brothers store, straight down to the misspelling of ammunition. Inside, you can take a look at all the in the white prototypes that Browning created and sold to Winchester. Next to that space, a look at Law and Order and also one of our many visible storage areas in the museum. An old favorite of the Cody Firearms Museum that was originally put in place in 1991 is our Adirondack hunting cabin. In here, you can see Theodore Roosevelt's firearms, Ernest Hemingway's firearms, learn about ethics in hunting, as well as the overall American history of conservation. Another uh, installation that was in the old museum is our arms factory that has been reinterpreted to showcase how people actually worked and what their lives were like in the Old West and also working for firearms manufacturers in the late 19th and early 20th century. If you've been to the old Cody Firearms Museum, you recognize the Winchester Stone. Around the factory, we then go into an exploration of the popular Western manufacturers that existed, where they existed, mostly in the Connecticut River Valley. And it takes a deeper look for the people who might be interested in firearms by manufacturer. If you're not necessarily interested in the intricacies of each of those companies, we break it down thematically in this section so you can see the different types of firearms people were purchasing, some of the mergers and lawsuits that went on because this is an incredibly dramatic time for firearms history. And this is just an opportunity for you to go deeper into the West and the firearms. Here's our special exhibits gallery. Now this is a rotating space and is currently doing a history of firearms and marketing but it will rotate annually and feature all different kinds of topics. One topic we're exploring is bring back guns from Afghanistan, as well as a firearms and fashion exhibition. Next to our special exhibitions is our Art of Firearms Gallery. Now this bright pink gallery showcases not only highly embellished pieces that were used for world fairs, presentation to presidents, but also a look at the way that that technology was actually interpreted and influenced by whatever the fashion of the time was. It looks at individual engravers and artists and then starts to look at the evolution of how people evolved their technology and evolved their art form into the 20th and 21st century, like these wheel gifts firearms that were originally a part of the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. Part of that is still there, and part of it is now at the Cody Firearms Museum. 
Next to art, you of course have science. This is an entirely hands-on gallery that allows people to learn about the science of firearms and ammunition. But of course, we always start with firearm safety. These signs are actually throughout the entire firearms museum so that when you are about to interact hands-on with something that is related to firearms technology, you completely understand how to respect that object and learn a little bit of real world application for firearms. Through this section, you can see ammunition, ballistics, scopes, and off to the right here, you've got an interpretation on rifling, a video of the popular outdoor channel show, Hollywood Weapons, to see if you can myth bust things that you see in the movies. These two simulators are traditionally showcasing long range rifle as well as shotgun. They are paid simulations. And then the most popular part of the science gallery is the trigger gallery that shows the evolution of the trigger from hand cannons with no trigger to matchlock triggers that have the operate as a lever to the crisp trigger that we associate with modern firearms, as well as allowing people to feel different trigger weights so they can see why people would want to have a lighter trigger for sport and a heavier trigger for self-defense. Another popular gallery on the main level of the Cody Firearms Museum is our Military History Gallery. This gallery features not only the firearms of war, but also the way we fight wars and that impact on this individual soldier as well as society. What you're looking at here is a mural and video that showcases the different costs associated with war, from financial to soldier to civilian to global impact. Around this central feature, you start with the earliest forms of warfare done on American soil, and you can see the firearms and weaponry as well as read panels that talk about how it was used, different social structures that were going on at the time, and how this war and tactics impacted the civilian population. You will notice another access point from the Firearms of the West. If you enter from Firearms of the West, you enter during the Plains Indian Wars. As you continue around the gallery, you start to come into the 20th century and the birth of global war and featuring modern warfare. In this gallery, you can also fire a pneumatic version of an M2 machine gun. On the opposite side of the cost of war, we look at how firearms were used to save soldiers' lives inside our tent. Now, this military tent is made as kind of a quiet space so that people can come and read firsthand accounts of soldiers throughout all of history. But if you yourself are a veteran, you can also leave your own story that will become a growing part of the Cody Firearms Museum. And our lower level has gotten a complete facelift and is a public access firearms research library. It also interprets some of our air rifle collection, seen here. But the real thing that people spend a ton of time with are the prototypes. These prototypes weren't always on display in the old museum. And so from the Gatling gun right there that was used in the early experimentations of what becomes the mini gun to all of the prototypes organized by designer and whether they were adopted or not, but how they inspired new designers and new technology in both civilian and military firearms history. You could probably spend days down here in the gun library, and this is probably the biggest and most comprehensive visible storage section that we have. We have it organized both alphabetically as well as by country of origin for the military. Another part of this gallery is the history of collecting, the art of collecting, where we will feature annually different collectors' collections. Right now, we are featuring the collection of Dan Shuey. Around the corner from that is our 
firearms research and conference room. If you are a researcher, you're welcome to come interact with our staff, schedule in advance, and do your own research at the Cody Firearms Museum. Uh, so that's a little look at the Cody Firearms Museum that we rebuilt. Um, a little background on it as my cat is now wandering around in the room. Um, you know, we, the Cody Firearms Museum was originally the Winchester Arms Museum and it was installed in the lower level of another one of our museums at the center um, in 1980. And then they built that space for the museum when it became the Cody Firearms Museum in 1991. And we redid it in, um, we redid it la last year. God, it doesn't feel like that, Danny. <laughs> seems a, it seems on a way different timeline, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. All right, so I'm pulling up the chat. So if you guys have any questions about the collection, about the museum itself, you know, Danny and my personal hobbies, I mean, we're, we're down to answer questions. <laughs> I'm going to scroll up and just see if I um, missed any from while it was presenting. Uh, Scott, yes, I saw that when I pulled my phone up about the cursor for the menu bar, so I, I caught that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys like it. <laughs> yeah, someone commented on the visible storage. Do you want to talk about that, Danny? Yeah, I'll talk about those. Um, so the visible storage comes from, the actual racks themselves come from a company called Staba Art in Germany. Um, they converted a design of one of their art racks. Uh, there's a couple, if you're familiar with museum suppliers in the U.S., there's a couple different ones, I think, that carry their stuff. Um, the, um, the stuff in there is sort of, you know, they're just big rolling racks and then horizontal drawers. Um, so we're limited on how much we can add. I saw that somebody asked if we're adding to it. Um, so we, we more than doubled the number of racks during the renovation, but we're not always adding new racks because um, it's a pretty intensive um, process and there's quite a bit of infrastructure for each one of those racks that has to go in above it. And so we're not regularly adding um, racks. So we, we're kind of a fixed number of what we can display in open storage right now, but it does greatly, greatly increase our capacity. I think just in that um, the gun library downstairs, we have about 1800 firearms. Um, and that's not counting the vertical storage uh, that's upstairs because uh, we work that into both levels. Um, so yeah, it lets us display, I think that gets us from displaying like a third of the collection um, in terms of number of firearms to over half, which um, when you're thinking about most museum collections, um, displaying half of your collection is, is is a pretty incredible number, you know, um, yeah, you know, unheard of. Five percent <laughs> is a good number in museum terms. So yeah, that's that's what I can say about that. If you have more questions about the details, um, somebody asked if people notice and look into uh, look look at them. So um, funny story is that like the we have two different types of vertical storage or not vertical uh, visible storage, and in the evolution of firearms gallery, they're just drawers and they're made by a different company. And people don't notice those as much so because people keep telling me that I need to put like pull out, you know, on the on the drawer. And I said, if you can't figure that out on your own, then I think that that's a, <laughs> then, you, then you miss out. But the, the other ones, yeah, people are always opening them, shutting them. But, you know, what we found was interesting because we thought, you know, oh, you know, gun people are just going to, you know, drool all over this which they do but like it's kids and like grandmas i've seen so many grandmas like opening and shutting not that grandmas can't be gun people you know but i've seen so many like people interacting with it you know i think it's just giving you something to do you know and and so people love it people love it so much that uh should i say it danny i think in this group we can say it okay uh, people love it so much that i was back in cody filming a tv show and um uh, I was like giving a tour to the production crew and I heard the loudest bang and the, um, I was like, so something's not right. And I went like, and I went like, you know, like looking around, looking around, I saw this big crowd of people and these guys are holding up one of our visible storage racks. Like it 
you know, and like for the record, like those things have been in use, like the ones that are upstairs for like seven or eight years and we've never had an issue. Um, and uh, they basically, I guess a piece like sheared off. So when they pulled it out, it kept coming. And I was like, oh, hey guys, what are you, what's going on? And Danny was, uh, you know, I, I decided that that was the curator's responsibility. So I called Danny a bunch and he didn't answer. So we had to handle it, but uh, no artifacts nor people were harmed when the rat kept coming. Um, let's make sure we get to all these questions. Yes. I'll answer the next one. Um, so somebody asked about the crowding and people around. We do get a lot of people using them, but we haven't had an issue um, yet with crowding. Probably our busiest interactive is that shooting simulator up front. That one will draw a crowd in the summertime. Uh, people really like that one. And so um, right now it's free, so there's no charge for it either. You know, it's not an upcharge or anything like that. Um, so people spend a lot of time there, but we've, we've kept an eye on it and they seem to be pretty good about like being conscious of their surroundings and moving on um, when there's a line. So we haven't had any issues like that yet. Our biggest issue is like Ashley said, that wear and tear on these racks, um, and, you know, especially the older ones that we had from before has been an issue. Um, um, yeah, and then the trigger interactive was yeah. the most, is the, as you saw in the video, there were a couple of them missing. Um, and that's because, I mean, when we opened the museum, you couldn't hear the Hollywood Weapons video playing because they, people were like pulling the triggers, you know, cause we figured people would go up and they'd pull the trigger and be like, that's cool. But like, no, they're like, like gangbusters on that. I mean, it's, it's insane. And um, they've broken them many, many times. We have uh, one of our gallery guards is also a gunsmith. So we're like, Hey, fix this please. Um, because it uh, definitely pushes, uh, pushes it to the limit. <laughs> Uh, Ed's question about a full auto Winchester 1907 really a thing. Um, so I haven't read the meeting Meerschaum magazine that you mentioned, but uh, the full auto 1907s were, are a thing. Uh, we do have one in the collection, at least one off the top of my head. Um, so they're scarce, but they, they were a thing to answer your question. Uh, do we rotate what's on display? Um, so to show the other half of the collection. So, um, in theory, <laughs> um, in theory, we, we will and, and, and should. Um, we don't as often um, for the, well, for two reasons, really. One is that, you know, really we got the good stuff out on display. And so a lot of the stuff that's still in the vaults is, you know, duplicates, things that a researcher might want to see because it's like the, you know, 15th, <laughs> you know, model 70. And, um, you know, so something that people can access easily, but then um, it's also probably going to be slated eventually for a deaccession because we already have, it's already like, if it's in the vault, it's probably on display somewhere too. Um, and so we're looking into that. The rotating exhibits will definitely do. Um, and, uh, we, I don't know, Danny's, that's Danny's job now. I get yeah. to like sit back, but we've talked about other things like a fashion exhibit, um, like fashion and firearms, because uh, Winchester sold some pretty dapper clothing. And uh, Betsy Johnson actually uh, had a whole gun line in the like 80s and 90s, which was kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. Does that storage um, method, the amount of objects on display change insurance quotes? I don't think uh, so. No, the, the, <laughs> Obviously, any museum collection is, is insured, and we never do talk specific values, but um, if, it's, if it's on site, the, that doesn't really change for us. Yeah, um, someone said it's funny to see that the racks are from Germany because you wouldn't see firearms in Germany. Um, there are art racks, not firearms racks. <laughs> um, yeah, they, so they're, they're, they converted them for us, um, and they can do that, but they're actually meant to store art. So it was just um, something years ago we tried and it worked and they've been really good partners with us. And each one of those racks that you saw holds individually about eight long guns. Um, it changes a little between what we're putting in there, but um, it's about eight per, per rack. Uh, best time of the year to come if you don't want to deal with the large crowd. That's a tough one because like I would say spring or fall, but then sometimes it's like we get snowstorms and then you can't get here. <laughs> but yeah. Spring or fall, um, winter, I mean, if you want to come in and like, if you want to 
come and go skiing in Red Lodge like an hour down the road. I mean, winter is really great because it is pretty empty. We're not open every day, but it's pretty good. Yeah, if you come during the winter, you get the museum to yourself. We missed a question up higher in the chat and I'll oh, I did. grab that one. Um, asked, oh, where, now I can't see it. Uh, but it was a question about um, what should be on, how we decide what should be on display. And um, so to give an example, like a working example of that, um, I'll use the military gallery since I sort of manage, actually manage the content script for the renovation and then I manage the object list. Uh, and so we would, we wrote the script first. Um, so we sort of, we had the design layout from our design firm. Um, and then we sort of filled out that content script where we wanted to talk about certain things, certain topics, what topics we wanted to talk, talk about. And then I really sat down with the collection database and thought about what objects would tell, would fit that script for a particular area. So um, it was a sort of a multi-layered process of understanding the space we would have, understanding the uh, stories we wanted to tell, and then pairing those stories with artifacts. Um, and so that was how we went about selecting. So like, um, for the military gallery, like how we picked the guns in the global war case. So that covers World War I and World War II. Uh, previously in the museum, we had exhibited U.S. military firearms pretty heavily, but had not exhibited our non-U.S. military firearms that extensively. Uh, and so we made the decision that we would try and represent for those two conflicts as many major powers as we could. So it was really trying to pick like all right, I can get, you know, these three guns from France in here. I can get these three from Germany. I can get a couple from the US, UK. Um, I can fit a couple minor power firearms in here. So we tried to go for um, a wide swath of representation versus a narrow, let's display every US World War I firearm that we can right there um, to use a specific case example. But that's a little bit about how we um, selected artifacts. Um, and then I've got a question about um, what a big museum like Cody would consider a good curriculum um, and volunteering if you want to be in the museum field. Um, so I don't know, I hired you, Danny. I don't even <laughs> remember your resume. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, a good curriculum, I think, um, when I'm looking at, you know, future museum employees is, um, you know, a combination of practical and theoretical. Um, you know, obviously, if you can get a museum studies certificate, um, if you're going to go into curatorial, you should have some kind of area of interest um, and the museum background. And if you don't, if you can't access, you know, a museum program, um, you can always just get that through internships and volunteering in museums. Um, but you definitely need to have a focus. Uh, if you want to just be more general museums, that's more uh, along the lines of like a registrar or someone who deals with the paperwork coming and going. Um, but that, but yeah, I think practical experience is incredibly valuable when I'm looking at, um, hiring somebody, I think that I weigh that probably more heavily. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't scoff at volunteering. I mean, obviously there's not always opportunities. And so if you can get in with a museum you want to have experience with, uh, volunteer there, maybe that an opportunity pops up so it can expand into something else. Uh, the other thing that I do look at, if it's not an internship, I look at um, how long you've been at a place. And if you, if you job hop, I really, I don't like that so much. I know it's a very anti-millennial thing for me to say, but I'm not a huge fan of job hopping um, just because it's so prominent in our field. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, good and bad things about our field. And so if somebody's been somewhere, and, I, and I'm not saying like, you know, obviously if you're young, you know, I'm not gonna judge that, but like, you know, two years, uh, I, a lot of times when people hop every two years and they've been doing that for like 15 years, that's a red flag for me. Um, let's keep going because we got a ton of questions and then luckily we're just rolling into Danny and I talking some more so we can go over a little bit. Uh, most modern gun in the museum's collection, Danny. So in a conventional sense, it would probably be the, um, the SIG M17 or the Barrett that we got, you know, when we we're flushing out the military gallery, we realized that our modern firearms were pretty, is a weaker side of our collection because people don't really think to donate those. Um, and so SIG gave us a M17 um, for that's, that purpose. That's not the answer. 
But the actual answer of the most most modern is a 3D printed, a set of 3D printed guns. So we have a 3D printed Glock, a 3D printed AR. Um, Liberator. A Liberator and a Songbird um, that came in as a, as a group. Um, and the follow-up question is the oldest firearm in the collection is probably one of the hand cannons that's in that timeline display. Um, we're not entirely sure if they're authentic, but one could potentially date to the mid uh, 1400s. And Winchester actually bought that one in China um, in the 20s, I think. And that, so that one came to us through the Winchester collection. Yeah. Um, uh, Ben's yeah. asking about world of guns. Oh, Hi, ben. Yeah. we know Ben. Uh, <laughs> um, I should probably answer that because he's waiting for an email response from me. I know, I know. I was like, oh, Ben, <laughs> we miss you. Um, you answer it then, Danny. Yeah, so uh, to Ben's question about if there's more plans, I'd love to do more. Um, it's it's a little bit of a challenge giving, you know, especially after this year, like everybody's really, really wary in the field about um, uh, funding going forward because museums as a whole are taking a pretty big hit uh, in 2020. Um, so yes, I would love to do a collaboration with somebody like World of Guns, um, but if we can actually pull it off remains to remains to be seen so oh, uh danny just i don't know if you know this because i've been managing the list of people we have some sig people here some people from SIG. Oh. <laughs> so oh, you didn't even thing, know to good thing i didn't like say anything bad about sig there i guess yeah right <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh someone said uh how often do you guys maintain the collection do you have an expert uh when maintaining the rare antique collection uh i mean we're constantly doing maintenance on the collection um uh, i mean it's not necessarily as um, you know, it's not like we go through and clean, you know, everything on a rotation. We, we should, but uh, we actually have a whole conservation department, which is awesome. I don't know if Bev's on here right now, but um, the nice thing is, is when we have any kind of active damage um, and even just cleaning stuff up, I mean, they, they're really great and they can, we, you know, transfer it down there um, if it's something that kind of goes beyond our area of expertise. But, you know, in the museum field, you are trained to be able to care for various collections. And so um, not to say we are experts, because I don't use that term, but uh, for myself, but um, I think that, you know, we are capable of doing a lot of the kind of basic things that we do for the museum. And with the basic stuff, it's, you know, dust, keeping the dust off of it. Um, if we need to do any type of, of, you know surface work um, we use we dab ethanol with a q-tip and uh, you can take a uh, guck off of <laughs> you can take guck off of uh, the firearm with the ethanol and then we use a thin layer of microcrystalline wax um, on the firearms and that's basically it because the the reality is is yes our firearms are operable no we're not allowed to fire them anymore museum practices changed uh, over the years people used to be able to fire them um, in the collection um, and so we don't do anything to deactivate our firearms but we also respect the fact that they are artifacts not necessarily firearms and so we want to preserve them forever um, and so we do things differently than you would necessarily than you might do um, and I know you're gonna talk about this later Danny um, than what we do if we were or, um, you know, trying to keep them up to shoot them. Yeah, clean for us is, you know, a, a clean and good condition firearm for us is a little different from, you know, your average firearms owner. You know, they tip, you know, and a, a person that has a gun in their personal collection and wants to go shoot it, you know, it has to be maintained to a certain standard to be able to function reliably. Um, and like Ashley said, while ours are operable and we don't alter their function, uh, we also don't need them to go work flawlessly at the range, you know, through a few hundred rounds or something like that. So our, our standard is a little bit different. And um, the other big consideration is we have really good environmental uh, controls. Um, and if, you know, something happens, we have that conservation department. And the other big one is staff time. If we, if we came up with a dedicated, like detailed maintenance schedule, um, we could not afford to do that for a number of, a number of reasons. Okay. And I am going to cut off. Well, I'm going to answer the questions that are here, but no more new questions. And we'll go on to the other topic after this. And we'll let's crank through these real quick. Yep. Um, does the Cody Museum accept donations of old firearms? Yes, we do. Um, yes, we do take estate collections. Um, but I will say that, you know, because our collection is so large um, that we typically... 
I feel like we're turning things away a lot um, because we don't feel like it's fair for it to just come in and sit in the vaults forever and always because we know that we already have, you know, all, you know, multiples of that type of firearm. Um, when we've got the time, I know that when I was uh, back, when I was, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and, you know, wanted to help the world, um, I would try to find uh, another museum for a lot of those artifacts that were more local. Maybe didn't have the collection that we have. You know, we like, we believe in, you know, sharing the love with the collections. So we do take, all, we do take firearms as uh, donations, but um, know that because the collection is pretty large, um, you know, it's, it's, we have to review everything and go through a collections committee now um, to make sure that it's something that we need in the collection so that we don't have to worry about surplus and that collection item not being respected as much because it gets sit, sat in a vault forever. <laughs> uh, do we have oddities, Danny? Uh, we do and, uh, have oddities. Um, ours tend to be older than the ones you mentioned. We, have um, so we don't have a, yeah, we don't have a penguin pen gun, but we have, we have a pen gun. Yeah, we have we have a pen gun. We have some cane guns. Um, a some, tourist curve would be fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Does a does a Lorsen count as an oddity? Because we have one of those. <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, we um, back to the question of do we accept um, collections and uh, not just old stuff. We do accept modern stuff, and we randomly don't like don't assume we won't take it because we have a lot of stuff. Because like we have weird holes in the collection. <laughs> Uh, someone said, can we talk a little bit more about the science section of the museum? What does it cover? I guess I'll probably do that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was the, that was the uh, gallery that I avoided writing <laughs> the most. And my mom, I think is on here. She's a physics teacher. So I was calling her, uh, probably should have called her a little bit more. Um, but so the science gallery right now, um, it's, it's more for like basic, basic knowledge. We don't get into too much um, in depth. So the trigger section, that is for people to see the evolution, well, two things, the evolution of triggers, um, because triggers didn't always serve the same function. Like the match lock was, feels more like a lever lowering uh, a burning rope down and the wheel lock um, mechanism actually doesn't uh, make the hammer mechanism move. It um, makes a wheel spin. And so we wanted people to see that the trigger has evolved and it's not always been the same thing. And then the other half of that exhibit is trigger weights. So people understand, you know, why you would have a gun with a five pound trigger, why you would have a gun with a two pound trigger um, for competition, for self-defense. And then just for fun, we threw in a New York style trigger in there, which is uh, very heavy. Um, and then we've got a, just a very basic um, ammo section that talks about reloading, the basics of a cartridge and shotgun shell. Um, it's just a very simple, very you know basic level. But next to that, we have a ballistics um, exhibit where uh, we've got fired bullets and we have you try to match the rifling. Um, so it's a, it, under a microscope and it's got a TV screen up and you try to match the rifling to um, a, a control bullet. Then we've got sighting. Um, we go everywhere from like your iron sights up through laser sights and um, optics, uh, rifling, different types of rifling, different twist rates. Uh, we've got a very brief thing on passive versus active safeties mechanisms on firearms. And then we do um, two simulators. One's just a shotgun simulator and the other is a long range rifle simulator where you can do some military style training with that. Uh, uh, is your microcrystalline wax Renaissance wax? It is. Um, it is Renaissance wax. Uh, hello, Lorson. Do we have a collection of training guns? Um, um, not specifically but training but firearms, but we have the we have a, a pretty extensive uh, factory cutaway collection from Winchester, which is somewhat similar in concept, but not um, not quite the same. And we've talked about um, having a working collection of things that are not rare. So like a representative collection that doesn't get accession through the museum process, therefore you can fire it. So that if we needed to do demonstrations or video work, um, we have it all on site. So we've talked about that, but that's a big undertaking. Um, and then Chinese gun collections, I think we got caught up. Um, yeah. Go for it. Uh, oh, uh, we don't specifically have like a major Chinese firearms collection. Um, our, a couple of our firearms are Chinese, but it's not because like it's dedicated, you know, it's our hand cannon is, um, yes. probably. Oh. <laughs> is probably. <laughs> is the Maybe. Maybe. Iffy. 
<laughs> um, and like our, our solitary AK is, um, so hand cannons to AKs are both Chinese. Um, but no, we do not have a specific one. It's, uh, n our strongest collections are American and Western Europe. Um, I'd love to expand the, you know, broader Asian and Middle Eastern collections, but, um, people know us as the Winchester Arms Museum still to this day. And so most, I'd say 80% of the donation offers we get to expand the collection are some variant of Winchester. Um, yeah. So, um, but we should